in my experience as a trans person, as soon as, you know, like politics and culture start to talk about it, people come out of the woodwork with opinions, right? And the internet blows up. Seeing what people thought and felt and seeing how much that polarized with my experience was like an, also a big draw to like say something about it. I've never been one to shy away from conflict. Speaking up when I saw that there was like a disparity between two things was never an issue for me. Joining us in the studio today is a thrill-seeking, groundbreaking mountain bike rider who is shattering gender norms in the sport as she makes way for future generations. Please welcome Blake Hansen. Hi, Blake. Hi, happy to be here. So great having you on the show. Um, it's been forever, and I don't think our paths have actually crossed live yet, right? Right. I've known about you. You might have heard my name in the past, but uh, it's great to meet you. Yeah, you too. I've definitely heard about you, and I'm kind of new with the brand. It's This is my second year, so um, yeah, we haven't gotten a chance to cross, but good time to do it. We will. We will for sure at a formation or sea otter or something, right? Yeah, we will. Cool. Um, Blake, where are you calling in from today? Where are you in the world? So I am at home in Bellingham, just moved here from Salt Lake uh, right before Christmas. So up in the corner. How are you liking Bellingham? It's a pretty cool hood. It's good. Yeah, it's it's raining right now, which it likes to do this time of the year. Um. But it's been fun to, so I snowboard in the winter in Salt Lake. I put the bikes away pretty fully for a few months. Um, and my goal with coming up here was to do that less. So it's been fun to do that less. It's kind of been like two weeks on, two weeks off in terms of uh, precipitation and temperature. So mm. every couple of weeks I get to get back on the bike for a bit until it freezes over again. So you're cross training a little bit. Yeah. I mean, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, Blake, you grew up in Utah, but you spent a significant recent amount of time in Southern California too. Is that right? Backwards. So I grew up in SoCal until I was like 20, 19 or 20. And then um, with a couple year hiatus, moved to Utah when I was 21 or something. Ah. And I've been there until now. So yes, probably almost an even amount of time in each place. Were you born in SoCal? I was born in SoCal, then moved to um, Florida. So my my mom's family is from the East Coast. My dad's family is from out this way. Um, born in California, moved to Florida for 10 years, raced BMX, did that kind of stuff, wakeboarded, and then moved back to California when I was in middle school and then grew up the rest of my youth there. So I am, um, I'm a Valley boy, born and oh, yeah? raised in the San Fernando Valley. So I'm <laughs> nice. curious, where, where were you, uh, where, where did you live when you were in SoCal? Yeah. So I was in a little town called Canyon Lake outside Lake Elsinore. Okay. Which is outside of Temecula, which is outside of Riverside, generally speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to go in that reverse order for people who like don't know the specific area. Yeah. Yeah, I got to zoom out for sure. Yeah, yeah. I miss I miss LA and well, I miss certain things about it, but um, mm -hmm. I've been in Chicago for quite a, quite amount of time now. Yeah, that's quite a cultural change, eh? Oh yeah. So Bellingham now um, is Bellingham now home for the foreseeable future? Are you looking to grow some roots there, or is this just another stop along the way? I would say. My goal is to grow some roots. I just wanted a place that was familiar in the sense of it offered me the things that I like to do with a similar crowd of people. Um, yeah. In Salt Lake, I've definitely had the best time living there for the last 11 years, basically my entire adult life up to now. Um, I'm 32 now for reference. So this is kind of just the next iteration of maybe 10 years, but also I'm not like, I'm not going to force it. If it only lasts a year or two and I'm back in Salt Lake, that's fine. Yeah. But, you know, I don't, I try not to do things half-assed, which is why I've been in Salt Lake for so long. So 
uh, yeah, the goal is to, to settle down and get into a good flow of outdoor activities, I guess. Great place for it. Do you know our local, we have a local um, team member out there, uh, Chris Mandel, mm -hmm. cross paths Chris. with Chris. He's a new friend of mine. I met him this past summer before I moved here. Um, and he was one of the first people I saw right before I moved for good. And he was like psyched to have you here. So I'm excited to get to know him better. Awesome. Super cool, dude. Yeah, he's awesome. Amazing rider. I've only ever ridden behind Chris, though. Never <laughs> side by side or in front, yeah. only behind. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to have him uh, around. Hannah Bergman just recently told me that um, when she's interested in doing different stuff with her shocks and forks and stuff, she sends them to him and he'll give her fun custom shim stacks and things. So, oh, yeah. The secret's out, Chris. I'm coming yeah. for you. <laughs> Chris, sex. Chris, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> All right, Blake, let's let's go back to the beginning. So sure. we already know where you were born, but let's talk about your parents. Uh, what did your parents do when you were growing up? Yeah, so um, great question. They met in Utah, ironically. They both went to mm -hmm. Brigham Young University in Provo um, from opposite sides of the country, met there, got married. My dad um, is a fun kind of like classic pick yourself up by your bootstraps story. He started, um, as a delivery driver, I think for Arrowhead water and didn't finish school because he started to like excel in his job, uh, instead of like, it was just going well for him. He was good at that, which I think that I take after him in that way. Um, and eventually became like a, he, he moved from that to Frito-Lay driver and then just moved up the PepsiCo chain up to like some sort of vice president of something. I think vice president of something. Mm -hmm. um, Sweet. And then, yeah, crazy. Just with no college degree. Amazing. And uh, eventually got laid off in like the 2008 recession which is when I graduated high school and then he got a different job and has done a handful of things since then. And that's when they moved out of the state um, and have since come back to Sacramento. So they live in NorCal now. And my mom uh, has an English degree. Um, her first degree was in English and she did editorial work for newspapers and magazines, which is ironic as well, because that's my degree now I did, I studied communication journalism at the university of Utah and, uh, went back to school 10 years ago, my mother, and now she is, um, a res registered dietitian. So oh, wow, she's quite an Excel accelerator of studies. Do you lean on her for nutrition advice in your current career? Sometimes. So when she was, um, in between her two careers, she, she raised us and stopped doing editorial work. Cause that's kind of, it's a very time consuming type of job to be an editor. Um, and when she quit that job, she got into nutrition and was a personal trainer and fitness instructor and stuff. So we've always just kind of grown up under the guise of her, uh, expertise. You know, we never yeah. like we had Reese's puffs in the house growing up, but for the most part, like we tried to, she tried to keep us on the straight and narrow in terms of nutrition. So I do feel like growing up, I had a really good grasp on how to be healthy and, yeah. out and all that stuff. Yeah. You said the word us. So I'm just going to open that door. Siblings. What's Siblings, your sibling yeah. count look like? I'm the like? oldest of three. I have, we're all like two years apart. My brother, Kendall lives in NorCal near my parents. He just had a baby, cutie little baby. Ooh. Yep. And um, he is, I think, an industrial engineer. He's some sort of engineer. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Something like that. And then- I wonder if my sister knows what I do. Yeah, I, I don't know. He's an engineer and he's really smart. <laughs> um, and my sister, the youngest of the three of us uh, lives back home in, in SoCal now, in Temecula, and she has three 
little babies. So I'm the oldest. No way. So I'm the oldest of three, and I have no kids. But you're an aunt, so you kind of have kids. Yeah. I definitely don't get to see them as much as I want, but I'm going home next month to see all of them. So I'm excited about that. You you know, being being an aunt is like, or an uncle, um, being an aunt or an uncle is like having kids without all the responsibilities or burden of like, you know, punishment or rules. Like yeah. you just get to spoil them and love them and have fun, right? Yeah. It's going to be really nice to hand them back when I see them next month. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cool. Let's stay in that young mode. So Blake as a kid, what kind of activities were you into? Were you a rambunctious kid? Were yeah. you into so, sports? Were you a reader? What, 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 tell us about <laughs> young Blake. Definitely the rambunctious, maybe not black sheep, but black sheep of sorts of the family. We grew up um, and from a young age, we're a tennis family. So my mom... And her brother were big tennis people. They got us into tennis. Like I was holding a tennis racket before I was riding a bike. I think I learned how to ride a bike when I was like five. And I learned, started playing tennis when I was like three. So um, kind of was raised in that world, which is a very like, it's a, you know, like a country club sport. So it's not entirely my vibe. So I, yep. I ditched that sport when I was like 12 and started skateboarding and wakeboarding in Florida. Um, you know, somewhere before that, maybe like eight or nine, I started to get into more like the action sports side of things. Um, and after a few years of doing it, I was like, I'm not into this like structured tennis thing. So um, my brother stayed in it and the family at itself was very dedicated to that. My sister did it too until she ditched for um, piano and violin type stuff. Mm -hmm. music. Um, and so because of the way that the family was structured, like everything that I did was just kind of, it was supported always, but it wasn't like uh, invested in necessarily. Like we were very focused on Kendall and what he was doing. So I was just kind of like this out in the streets and out on the lake doing my own thing kind of kid. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but my dad was always really psyched about all that kind of stuff whenever we could, when we weren't, you know, traveling for Kendall's tennis or doing all these other um, tennis investing things. <laughs> it's a lot of money to train in that sport. Um, yeah. You know, we spent a lot of time on, we had a boat, we lived on a lake. So like my stuff was still, fostered just in a different way. I wasn't part of like the competition end or, you know, following a circuit like my brother was. Um, but we had a boat, we had dirt bikes, we had mountain bikes. I was just kind of always doing all these things. Yeah. What yeah. about music? You ever play a musical instrument? Yep. So I am a drummer of like 16 years as well. Sweet. We're a pretty musical family, actually. My mom is, uh, a pretty talented pianist. So she taught all of us piano. In order to play the drums, I had to learn how to read music and play the piano. And then <laughs> in recent times, I've picked up the guitar, which my brother is really good at. So everyone but my dad is a musician of sorts in the family. That's awesome. If there was a drum set put in front of you, could you just hop on and feel pretty comfortable? Definitely. Yeah. I had one until I moved here, actually. I got rid of it finally just in the bulk of moving. Cool. You're into a bunch of sports growing up. I'm curious, did you ever have heroes in any sport, whether it had been tennis or water sports? Were there athletic heroes that you looked up to? Yeah. I mean, I would say in all of the sports, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of person who gets very into things when I get into them. And so all of the sports that I've ever like dabbled in I've like heavily dabbled in so um obviously with tennis I have a lot of experience with that sport but like my I'm personally invested in it zero percent and have never entirely been it's just been like mm -hmm. what the family knows and does so my um you know like idols in the sport I guess have always been the ones doing it different and and doing it their own way, you know, like Andre Agassi was this guy who was like colorful when everyone was wearing white and, 
Venus and Serena were like breaking boundaries in ways that like blew my mind, like yeah. way above my understanding at the time. Um, and I always kind of idolized those types of people. So even before I kind of like put an emphasis on doing that myself in any sort of way, I was like, I've, I'm realizing now that I've always have, um, kind of put an emphasis on watching and admiring the people that have done it different and broken the mold and yeah. successful doing that too. Back to tennis just for a second, only because it's, it's relevant in the media. I just started watching Point Break, the new Netflix tennis series. Oh, I haven't even heard of it. You heard that. about this one? No. How about Drive to Survive? Have you heard about that one? Yes, I've heard of that the, one. The Formula I've not One. I watched it though. So it's a similar take. It's a sort of documentary series. It's only five or six episodes, but if you've got Netflix and you're a tennis fan, if you're still a tennis fan, Point Break, it's pretty rad. Sick. Okay. I do love that style of, of documentary, especially when it comes to like sports and stuff. So I'll probably watch that. It's cool. They follow the 2022 season and they've just chosen a few key athletes to to track their their progress through this the series and yeah, you just, you know, you learn all about the behind the scenes stuff and That's the drama cool. and it's it's great. I like that. There's a couple of ladies that are trying to do something similar in mountain biking right now. And I think the last time that I checked they were in the middle of getting someone at Netflix to buy their stuff. Oh nice. <laughs> Nice. So we'll see if that goes. Blake, let's talk about the bike then. So at what point in your youth did you discover the bike and discover enjoyment from it? Yeah. So the bikes have been consistent the whole time, I think. Um, everything else that I've done has just been kind of like this deviation that has eventually come back to bicycles, which is interesting because growing up, even into my 20s, like Biking was just one of my hobbies. It was never something that I like saw myself doing in any sort of professional sense, like at all. <laughs> um, but I raced BMX as a kid from like seven to 11. Um, after that, I got more into like freestyle BMX and was riding trails and jumps and skate parks and stuff like that just around the neighborhood with my little middle school and high school friends. And then my yeah. dad got me my first mountain bike when I was 15, 14 or 15. Um, and in the area that I grew up, it was very cross country. So I had a cross country, like a GT cross country bike with like three inches of travel. <laughs> um, and did a lot of that, but like I, I was a BMX kid. So I was always looking for fun stuff to ride rather than like fitness and trying to ride long distances or anything like that. So I was right. kind of rode my cross country bike, like a play bike, um, which was fun until I got a real bike, which didn't happen until I was 27. Hmm. So that's a really interesting like history with mountain biking. Um, in that sense, like I just rode a cross country bike for 10 years, like on everything yeah. in Utah, we, we have a lot steeper, bigger terrain uh, than SoCal. So I got really used to riding pretty gnarly stuff on a like suboptimal bike. So when I finally right. got a trail bike, like my progression just blew up and that has led me to here, I guess. What is your, what is your bike count today? If you had to count the number of wheels, how many wheels do you, do you own? Oh man. Wheels and bikes is two different things. There's 12 bikes in my possession currently. So 24 wheels, but then there's like four wheel sets of various sorts sitting around. So <laughs> right. Backups. What is that? Eight. There is like 32 wheels in my garage behind me. Nice. It's a lot. Love it. It's too much. I love it. Yeah. I love that you use the word real bike when I got a real bike. So you the cross country bike wasn't in your world it wasn't a real bike but now that you're on a trail and a long travel bike yeah. those are real bikes all the other bikes were just pretenders right i might get some heat for that huh 
<laughs> no, no, not at all. It's all about context. Yeah, contextually, the bike that I was playing on wasn't entirely doing what I wanted it to, and my brain says, "Not real, just a just a bit fun." <laughs> I when I that. got a trail bike, yes, I was like, my world is a different place now. All right, Blake, we're going to transition to the speed round here where we psych profile you. I'm going to ask you 15 quick, quick fire questions. Let's see how you do. Okay. You ready? Let's do it. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes, 100%. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Tacos or burritos? Tacos lately. Burritos historically. Spicy or mild? Spicy. Cold weather or hot weather? Hot weather. Rain or snow? Rain. Yeah, you're in Bellingham. Gotta get used to it. The mountains or the beach? Mountains. Cities or suburbs? Cities. Cars or trucks? Trucks. Pavement or dirt? Dirt. Gloves or gloveless? Gloveless forever. Really? Yeah. Clipped in or flat pedals? Flat pedals. Low pressure or high pressure in your tires? Depends. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Fix it yourself or take it to a mechanic? Fix it. Until you meet Chris Mandel. Fix it, and then Chris does all my suspension now. <laughs> <laughs> dogs or cats? Dogs. Awesome. And you have a couple dogs in yeah. your possession right now, right? We've got one. She's, she's sleeping over here. All right. And then the other one is also white and three times the size in, in the front room. Awesome. What are their names? Next to me is Louie. Um, she is like seven-pound Yorkie Poo. And then Sweet. my girlfriend's dog, Raleigh, is in the front room, and she's like 35-pound cattle cattle pit mix of some sort. So really more like a horse. A small horse. A very small horse. <laughs> yeah, she's not as comfortable to be in your lap. All right, let's move on to your career. So tell us about the beginning of, I mean, how did you transition from just being an all-around great athlete, good at a bunch of different things, to people paying you to ride your bike. Yeah. <laughs> at a later age in life, too. Yeah. Um, no, it's a really good question. I think, and it's a really interesting answer, kind of a longish, interesting answer. Um, we'll take the long story. But we got we'll time it. for it, I guess, eh? Yeah. So... Yeah, I I moved to Utah when I was 21, I think. Um, brought my bike with me, rode it casually for a few years. And when I really started to like get a tiny bit more into it, I never really had the funding or necessarily the desire to like swap it for a proper bike. So I kind of stopped riding bikes from like 23 to 27. And I was spending way more time riding dirt bikes, um, motocross stuff, some trails, but mostly track stuff. Um, and somewhere in that time frame, um, I came out and transitioned, um, had a just a crazy amount of life change. And in the time that that was happening, I kind of lost a lot of my saver and friends in the moto world. They weren't so much, I guess, into <laughs> trans or queer people. So I just started getting phone calls less from those people to go ride and, yeah. you know, going out and packing a dirt bike in a truck and going out and riding alone is a lot of work for, at least at the time, like not a whole lot of fun you know, just to do it alone and kind of dangerous in some ways. Yeah. So I just kind of grew out of love with it and sold my dirt bikes and um, suddenly decided that I had a lot of time on my hands to do hobbies and thought it would be a lot easier to get a mountain bike and do that alone um, in order to continue having fun on two wheels. So I went ahead and did that. I sold my GT and my dirt bikes and got um, an old giant rain. It wasn't old at the time. It was only a couple of years old at the time, but this was like 2017. And I think it was like a 2015. Yeah. So um, yeah. And then just, I was a freelance video editor and kind of lost 
all my work in the same year as well from this whole coming out and transitioning fiasco. So not only did I have like the loss of a hobby, but also the loss of a lot of my uh, day working hours to making money. So I just started riding my bike every day, like sometimes twice a day, sometimes for three or four hours at a time. And just kind of unbeknownst to me, started really dedicating a lot more of my energy and mind to doing that. And then that's kind of just led me to here. Yeah. There was a whole awakening maybe in like 2017, 18 with more and more of the country um, starting to talk about gender identity and queerness and, you know, racism and all this stuff started to really become culturally relevant. And then people started legislating against all kinds of things. Right. So this kind of just put me in a place of, I guess, feeling really scared and concerned with like what I was going to do. Um, you know, I, I didn't have very much work at the time because of all of this. And I had me and my bike and that was basically it. So I just started to really dedicate more of my time to doing that, even though there wasn't really like a viable path to monetize it. It was just like kind of all I had. So I just kept on doing it until that path started to become a little more clear. And now right. that is where I'm at. And so I'm really psyched and grateful to be able to be here and have done something positive with all this negative stuff that has happened in the last handful of years. Blake, uh, that's an incredible, well, first of all, thank you for sharing and being open about, about your story and your journey. Um, I can't even imagine how difficult that transition was for you. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to just stay there for a bit longer. Yeah. You had these massive obstacles. You had multiple communities, both a social community, a riding community, and a professional community, and they basically all rejected you. Sorts, yeah, I would say. Of sorts. What kept you strong and how did you keep going? Because I can only imagine how difficult that be that would be on, on anyone, but what kept you strong? You found the bike and that gave you strength, but, yeah. but there had to be something more, right? Something in you, was it, what was it? Yeah, good, that's a good question. Um, I think I say of sorts because even within all of the communities, there was a few key people that kept me um, in their scope and kept me, uh, well, I wouldn't say kept, kept me in their scope and made sure that I knew that I was welcome, at least in a small corner of each of these little worlds. Um, and I think the lack of complete rejection is maybe what helped me to hold on to something. I mean, I can't say that the entire motocross world was like, screw you, you're out of here. Um, because there was definitely a few people that, that were really kind to me throughout. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, I wasn't really welcome and I wasn't invited. And at the end of the day, the lack of phone calls is speaks volumes, right? So, um, yeah. I think that the people who work were kind to me throughout, um, just gave me the little tidbit of I'm okay to keep doing this. You know, it's, it's, I don't know. It, it was just a little bit of that, a little bit of will of my own, just, in my experience as a trans person, like seeing what they're saying about us and seeing what other people think. And as soon as, you know, like politics and culture start to talk about it, people come out of the woodwork with opinions, right? And the internet blows up. I think right. um, seeing what people thought and felt and seeing how much that polarized with my experience was like a, also a big draw to like say something about it. I've never been one to shy away from 
you know, conflict or uh, speaking up in any regard. Like it's just never who I am. I would say in terms of introvert, extrovert, I'm definitely an extrovert. And so speaking up when I saw that there was like a disparity between two things was never uh, an issue for me. And I think I was definitely scared at first, even for a few years to say anything in the mountain bike space, just because there was so much going on and I didn't want to get kicked out of, you know, the enduro series is that I was racing. Um, and so I wasn't afraid to, to say stuff to the local news media and, um, you know, to the people in my immediate life, but I certainly wasn't like advertising it and saying it out in social media world. And when I did, I realized how much positivity there is out there for it, as opposed to all the negative energy out in the greater world. And that kind of really fueled uh, the fire of me talking about my experience in hopes that it would help people to see that everything that you see out there is just untrue. Um, Right. So it it did take, it took a minute to like get the gumption to start talking about it on social media. But once I did, it was met with like so much positivity that honestly, I think that that has helped me to continue doing it. I'm only assuming that your family was super supportive, but how was your family throughout this whole time? So, um, I grew up LDS Mormon. Um, if they know people don't know what LDS is, but, um, super conservative Christian upbringing, you know, my family is conservative leaning conservative voting. So I wouldn't say that they were extremely supportive. Um, right off the bat, but everyone has led with love, I think. And that has kind of put everyone into a decent place of being able to somewhat be supportive. My siblings have been awesome. Honestly, they've, they went from, you know, all of us were raised the same way. And so we just weren't raised to like, understand that LGBT people should be treated the same and you know all the right. stuff like i i remember being on the street corners when i was 16 17 voting against gay marriage in california because that's what everyone in my church congregation was doing and i was asked right. to be there so i was doing that and looking back it's like so cringe <laughs> and i can't even tell you what i was thinking at the time but that's kind of the way we were raised and so we were raised being told, you know, that it's a sin, it's an abomination. And so it took my siblings a minute to get there, but once they did, they've been awesome. And now that now they definitely see the difference between, you know, the way we were raised and honestly reality. Like I'm still the same person I've always been. I still want the same things. I still love my family the same way. And I want them to love me the same way. And I think it's definitely been an eye opener for everyone. Um, parents have been a little slower to come around, but they do their best to lead with love too. And I, I give them that and we try to meander our way around all of the weird yeah, <clears throat> pieces with love. So powerful stuff. I'm almost, uh, I'm getting a little teary eyed here, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's switch a little bit talking about cycling and competition because, man, the the competitive sports world, they haven't figured it out, right? Right. We still haven't figured it out. And I know you're a pioneer in this regard to pave the way for gender and identity in sport and how we classify and register and compete against, you know, different categories. So I, I'd love a little education and I'm sure some of our listeners would too. Sure. Um, because I I don't understand what the narrative is, where we're headed, what the controversies are around how we can have different categories. Could you could you help us there? Yeah. I mean so 
I can speak for my experience and I can speak for what I think would help us all. But at the end of the day, there's nuance here. And I think that people, different people will want different things, right? Like some um, trans people are really excited and non-binary people specifically are really excited about seeing uh, new race categories. This is happening more in gravel in our world than anywhere else, but, you know, categories for them to specifically race separately from men and, and women. And that's, it's a, it's a complicated debate. And I think that that's great that that's being offered, um, for the people that want it, but not all people, not all trans people are gender divergent. Is that the way we'd say that people would, would necessarily want to be treated differently. So it's, it's a hot topic of like, where do people want to be put? And I think that at the end of the day, the answer is just listening to people and, and listening to the people doing the science, scientific research on it and not listening to anyone else because there's a lot of chatter. And at the end of the day, you know, I identify as female and want to race with the other women. I don't want to race with non-binary people super much respect to them. And if they want to race together, I'm psyched that there's stuff coming out for them to be welcomed and raced, be able to race as well. Um, but not everyone is non-binary. And so for more binary trans people like myself, you know, I want to be included. And so giving me a separate place to go without everyone is not inclusion for me and for a lot of other people. So at that point, I think we need to start paying attention to the science and the science obviously leans toward, uh, an equitable way to include people rather than, you know, trans people have an inherent advantage and should not be included. I don't think, I think there's a lot of people saying that and a lot of people thinking that because we were all raised the same way without, right. you know, the mind expansion of gender identity. Uh, and so we're not, wired to think that it's fair, although the science says differently. So, um, essentially just to like maybe round it up in a digestible statement, um, all of the studies that have been done on this and showing, shown the study of the performance decline of trans women, um, and the performance increase of trans men, for example, have have shown a decline for trans women at a certain point in time. I think the thing that people like to jump on and say it's not fair is because none of the studies have been extremely conclusive with each other. So some, right. for the longest time, the standard was uh, hormone replacement therapy for 12 months um, because some studies earlier on showed that uh, trans women's performance declined about 12% in that first year of hormone therapy, which roughly matches a cis woman's, uh, hormonal level and thus mm -hmm. performance. Um, and now that we've done a handful of more studies in the past three or four or five years, we've shown that that's a little bit more nuanced between one to two years. Um, and so we're starting to see like, uh, guidelines change from one year of hormone therapy to two years. Um, and then, you know, a testosterone lab test to make sure that you're in the right range, um, in order to compete with cis women. Um, I think that all of this is, is pointing us in a direction of being able to say, you know, after two years, there's, there's enough performance decrease that we have an opportunity for inclusion and fair performance. But at the end of the day, this is always going to be nuanced towards so many things. And, uh, I think a lot less, a lot more people are talking about testosterone levels, for example, than, than the nuance of athleticism from the beginning, you know, like the whole right. purpose of being able to compete is to be better than someone else. And so you're going to do things like weight train and do all, I mean, it's different for every sport, right? So everyone's going to do their best with the resources they have in order to beat the next person. 
Um, and at the end of the day, you know, like when I was racing enduro, for instance, I was doing it on my own dime. Um, well, after two years, I wasn't, I didn't even touch a bike for like three years, uh, after my transition, but regardless, you know, I was spending 50 or 60 hours a week working on my enduro racing game, I guess, maybe not that long, but it was like a full-time job because yeah. I just didn't have anything else to do. Um, and on my own, I was able to do a lot and I, but I mean, I, my resources were a lot less than someone on a factory ride. Right. So yeah, maybe I had some sort of performance advantage. I know that I didn't. Um, and my results show that I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> but I would have done a lot better if I had, you know, endless support the resources. factory yeah. ride and resources to train more and have better equipment and be at the places that you need to be to, in order to race, which is at the races. So I was able to like yeah. fund myself for like four races per summer. That was like the most I could do. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that my results over the three years that I raced uh, with the resources and the races that I was at uh, were pretty, like I saw myself progressing at a very similar rate to any of the other girls who were doing it at the same time as me, also on their own dime. Um, and the girls who were, you know, who started in amateurs with us, who got onto a factory ride pretty quick, were like light years ahead of us all. And so I think there's a lot more pieces to this puzzle than just like muscle size and testosterone level that people right. want to disregard um, in terms of, you know, where athletic advantage lies. So it's a really complicated thing. Um, but if we pause on the whole thing and we look at the bigger picture, um, you know, everything points to without issue, including trans people. Um, and I, I don't even think that's arguable unless you want to start talking about the gender binary and then conservatives the world over will have something to argue about, but you know, we don't entirely prescribe to that anymore and we shouldn't because we're humans and we should be able to do, we should be able to honor the way that we are. You know, I didn't make myself trans. I was born this way and I really pushed it away for 20 right. years. Um, you know, no one fought more against trans people than I did against myself. Um, and so I'm a walking, talking example of the reality that we're not going anywhere, you know, right? because I'm here. And I definitely tried not to be for a really long time. Right. Blake, would you be in support of if the governing bodies of sport had this massive testing protocol on the science side and just created sort of a banded system of testosterone and X and Y and Z, et cetera, and just published a guideline. Look, if you fit in, if you, if you test in, you're in, but if you don't, then you're out. Um, I think that I would need to see what those would be specifically like this last couple of years, a lot of guidelines have been changing as more, Research has been coming out, and now the IOC, for example, is um, is not even really using, I don't think, testosterone tests to regulate anymore. They're using, I can't remember what they're doing. It's a case-by-case -case basis. That's what I do know. Um, and, you know, I think I'm in support of people trying to include. I don't know that I'm in support entirely of making this a really complicated guideline thing to figure out and become in or out on. I think that's really difficult for trans people um, with what we're already up against. So, I mean, right off the bat, I think that it doesn't need to be 
super complicated. And I think people are trying to make it this really complicated thing. Um, but generally speaking, I think the case by case basis could be a good thing. I think it, only time will tell. Um, what about five categories? Could you have two categories of male, two categories of female, and then a fifth non-binary sort of open class? As in trans men, cis men, trans women, trans- Exactly. Or cis women and- Is that too women. complicated? I think it's still others for the trans women who, who just want to be included as women. Right. I think that if, and in, for instance, in cycling, any of our disciplines really across our entire industry and sport, you would see a flourishing cis class and a very thin trans class. Like there would be right. a lot of trans amateur trans athletes um, around, but because this inherent advantage that people talk about isn't real, there wouldn't be an, an extreme amount of trans people excelling to the professional, a comparable professional level. And so I think that that doing that that way still takes away my opportunity to do what I'm doing um, in a way. Right. So I, I would say that I don't support any sort of othering other than, you know, an open class for non-binary people just across the board. I think that should be an opportunity that that should be offered for people who want to be there. And if that's non-binary people and trans women and trans men who like are so against the binary, the gender binary that they could never do something else. Dope. Go race each other. That's tight. Right. But I'm trying to do something different. I'm trying to show that we don't have an advantage and that there is more than enough room for someone like me to win races without saying it's unfair and get support without saying it's unfair too. Right. So, yeah. Well, Blake, I think the key word too is inclusion, right? If we had five categories, that's completely the opposite of inclusion. Yeah. I mean, three categories is inclusion. It's inclusion on all fronts. And then yeah. everyone has the freedom to choose you know, with some sort of guidelines in place, I think that's fair uh, to be where they want to yeah. be. And that is yeah. exactly inclusion. Love it. Let's talk about you getting paid to ride your bike because I love that. And I'd love to learn more about, you know, how that came to be and how you, you know, carved out this niche and what kind of riding you love to do today. Yeah. It's a great question too. So I was racing enduro for three years on my own dime. I was um, I worked in a bike shop after I, this is a fun caveat after I, uh, got dropped from most of my freelancing contracts and didn't have much work. I was just riding a bunch and breaking parts and frequenting, uh, this bike shop called go ride in, um, in Salt Lake city. And eventually made friends with one of the shop managers there, Kenzie, who's now one of my best friends. And um, she convinced Scott, the owner, to hire me. And that was kind of what I was doing off the bike to pay rent. So I was doing that for a time and then eventually left there and got a job as a suspension tech, ironically, at Specialized, mm. which got me an ambassadorship with the brand. Um, and that's kind of where I've taken off from. So started as a shop employee, getting getting shop flow, and then um, moved to a brand and convinced them to let me on their their ambassadorship program. And that has led yeah. to a proper contract just last year. So this is only my second year of getting paid to ride bikes, but it's been kind of the goal since my other world it's pretty rad kicked me to the curb that is pretty rad yeah. and uh and you've just hooked up with sram and rock shocks the past couple of years as well right yeah so big shout to brooklyn bell who helped me get a hold oh, yeah. of um sarah gerald and your guys's crew um and that led me to a contract with you guys which we are renewing this year so 
Awesome. Still get to get paid to ride bikes. So great. Um, and, and not only just ride bikes. I mean, you don't just ride bikes. Like you do some pretty extreme gnarly shit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That and that's that's a story too. So I was racing. Sorry, in the middle of my saying, I was racing enduro. I caveated to working <laughs> in a bike shop. ADHD is in full force that's all right. today. <laughs> Um, it's all right. but yeah, I mean, after a few years of racing bikes, I got, uh, an Instagram DM from Katie Holden who asked me if I wanted to come dig at this new thing called Red Bull formation at the time. This was its second year, um, in existence and the free ride world has been really taking off in the past, I guess, four to five years. Um, and it's never something that I thought I would be doing. But film is something I always wanted to get back to without having to do it with the people who didn't want to include me. Um, yeah. And so I guess I saw that as an opportunity coming out to like learn about the free ride world um, to maybe start finding opportunities to do biking and filming together, um, which, you know, at the end of the day, are the two things that I have the most experience with in my adult professional life. So um, I kind of ran with that and got invited to come out. And, you know, I think it's, it's something I couldn't grasp before going to formation just because, you know, watching people do really gnarly stuff, like jump their bikes off cliffs <laughs> was like something I watched the boys do at rampage saying, that's crazy, but that's not me. You know, I'm, I ride trails and I ride small dirt jumps. You know, I don't right. ride my bike off cliffs and I don't even know how I would go about learning to do that. And then I'm in the desert digging for someone else doing that. And suddenly I was like, I guess I can conceptualize this. She's just going to let off her brakes there. And then pop here and then she's just gonna land down there <laughs> it's just mastering gravity and physics i mean i mean it really how hard could it be it really is just that and i mean it's complicated <laughs> and it's risky but i think being there and and having hands in the dirt and watching people do it and talking with them you know it was like my first time ever even really like communicating with a professional mountain biker that wasn't racing enduro. Um, yeah. and so it was this whole new world of just like learning about how this goes. And then all of a sudden I had an interest in it and that kind of came from Katie Holden saying, come over here and check this out. Um, and that has totally turned into this whole cool world that I'm excited about and, um, doing now, you know, like this is my second year doing it, I guess, full time. Last year was a bit of a proof of concept of committing to it after Katie Holden gave me the experience to come learn about it. I took that and ran with it and said, let's try it. And then um, have gotten to where I am now and, and kind of come out of the other side of the proof of concept and said, I think I can do this. And now that's what kind of this year is. Just getting into it. And so for everyone listening, when will we see 2023 Red Bull formation? Uh, that's going to be April, likely May uh, is when it happens. They, they Red Bull purposely put it six months away from Rampage. So we're each our own oh, yeah. thing. Um, so that will be the spring. I'm working hard to see if I can get an invite to that this year. Um, I definitely think that I'm ready after a year of proof of concepting myself. So, yeah. um, yeah. And if I don't get into that one, like I'm still pushing hard to get into other stuff. Proving grounds is a goal of mine this year. So yeah, we're just going to awesome. do it. Fingers crossed. Good luck. I hope to see you there. You. And, uh, I'll put in a good word. We love Katie, which reminds me, I need to get Katie on this guest list for Changing Gears. Yeah, she would be such I a do. good one. We met Katie in Whistler one year and she helped uh, teach my kids how to ride. Nice. Yeah, she's yeah. a legend. 
She's awesome. I think that you should definitely get her on. She's done a lot of stuff for a lot of us. You know, I don't think we yeah. would be here without her. Yeah. Super cool story. Yeah. Um, Blake, let's switch over to community projects and giving back. You know, this show is all about celebrating our athlete partners and what they do on the bike and those accomplishments, but also more importantly, probably even more importantly, what they do off the bike to give back and to, to make this world a better place. You know, we're this funny aspirational society, right? Where we look at our athletes in sport as heroes. And with that comes a certain amount of responsibility. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the community projects that you're involved in and what are you doing to either advance the sport or give back? Yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that I'm part of any exact community um, actions right now, but, um, you know, I, I kind of came into this space with a moving mouth in terms of like, I have a degree in communication journalism. So I've gotten different um, article opportunities on my way to here. And so I've, I've definitely every single time that I get given an opportunity, I try to um, speak a little bit on, you know, what I'm up to and what I'm doing as my own personal goals and as an athlete. But I also try to do as much, you know, low key educating and inclusion work as I can, you know, I'm not I don't consider myself, you know, like an activist per se. Um, but I think by proxy, right. it's important that I acknowledge who I am, where I am, and that other people can do it too. And so I guess maybe like my third or fourth title down is activist. Um, and so this past year, I was really focused on what I'm doing and focusing on my writing. Um, I think this year you'll see a few film projects come out, um, where I talk a little bit more about my process and, you know, what it's been like to be a trans person in the sport coming up. So I think in terms of community installations, I hope to do, to make an impact in that way. And I hope to continue to find opportunities, uh, to tell stories and, and, um, educate and connect with people across the industry. Um, and if anyone out there is listening and they want to include me in specific community activations, I'm just a phone call or a direct message away. Um, I definitely want to get more involved in the local Bellingham community here. I see a lot, um, you know, biking is a huge thing in this town and I see a lot of inclusion work going on around me. So I'm hoping to tap into that a little more this summer and hopefully find things to do and bring more queer people around because that would just be super cool for all of us, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. What if uh, USA Cycling or the IOC were to call up and say, hey, we're forming a board to help figure this whole thing out? Would you raise your hand? Yeah. I mean, I've been um, in a, at a couple of uh, USA Cycling round tables. I've never talked to anyone at the IOC. They don't know that I exist, but um, <laughs> we can change that. Let's change it. I'm I'm an open book in terms of that stuff, and I do think that I have uh, some observations and thoughts that I don't see being communicated very much at these um, meetings. So, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not racing anymore or, or competing on that type of level, but I have a lot of experience with it. And I think a lot of perspective on it that I think could be valuable to people if they want yeah. to talk to me. Absolutely. Well, I think you're also well-spoken and, and, um, approachable. And I think that that helps. Yeah. I try to be Blake. We are running, we are running out of time. No, you're doing great. We are, uh, we're running out of time though. And so this is, uh, this is where we wrap up. Sweet. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for being open, lead with love, awesome message. Um, I can't thank you enough. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. This has been a good one. Okay. Have an awesome day. You too. Thank you. Thank you.